Hello and welcome everybody. This is Drawing Together with Artist Network. My name's Scott Meyer. We do this every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern. We draw together. So if you're new to this show, you're going to want to know that this is all about us taking time out of our busy lives to draw. Um, we select a new image each week. We draw with a, with a certain amount of intentionality so that we can continue to build our artistic practice. So the idea is that it's all about developing healthy habits and working effectively. So um, with that in mind, uh, I want to show you what the, the new drawing is in a bit. But um, if you are going to follow along, you can find the link to the reference image in the description below. And uh, you can find a link to the page on Artist Network where you can post your work when you're done. So let's get to it. Welcome, everybody. Um, I see some comments about the, the website on Artist Network. So um, I can certainly address that. Um, let's see, I need to, there we go. Um, okay, there we go. So this is the drawing we're working on. I do want to talk about stuff at Artist Network to hopefully um, uh, alleviate any sort of concerns you might have about sharing your work. Um, we have made some new updates. In general, they're designed to make things smoother, more efficient for everybody, both on the back end of the site and for the customer experience. In the transition to the new site, um, some of the information is still taking some time to move over. Um, and then there was a, a feature that has now been fixed, which will allow you to share your work. So I was having trouble myself posting my own drawings, but it is now working. So I apologize to all of you who may have had any trouble um, over the week sharing your drawings of the sunflower. So um, this is what we're working on today, drawing of a duck. Uh, it is a, I thought it was a great image, and it reminds me of the, the one we did of the snow hair a while ago. Uh, for me, the, what I wanted to focus on was this sense of light. And, and at first, it didn't really stand out to me, but you can see this shadow kind of passing over the, the body of the duck, and you get these kind of hot spots on the left and the right sides. And that's what I was um, really kind of interested in exploring. Uh, and in utilizing kind of the texture, the form of the duck to help explore edges and uh, transitions between values and the quality of light and shadow. So there's a lot that we're going to be able to cover in this. I want to walk through the materials that I'm going to use. Um, again, for all of you who may be new, we don't have to, you don't have to follow along using the same materials if you don't have them. I, I love to hear your thoughts on the drawing process, what approach you might take, how it might be different from what I do. I'm going to talk through my own process and do the best I can to describe what's happening for me. But this isn't um, designed for me to describe the best way to draw. This is just my way to do it. Um, and so I love to see the exchange between us all about different approaches because that's why we're drawing together and not just sit back and watch me draw. So um, if you are new, and I, I'd love to see where you are viewing from because we have people from all over the world. Uh, yeah. Okay. Let's get to the drawing. So again, this is my preparatory drawing of the duck. The preparatory drawings just help me wrap my head around um, really what the key features are so I can, again, move into the this practice session today with a certain amount of intentionality. I believe that when you practice with intention, that's how you can um, really improve your skills and ingrain those skills more effectively over time. So uh, we'll kind of talk about that. I want to talk through some of the decisions that I'm making the um, as I go as well, um, and again, hear from you all. This paper here is the Strathmore toned gray paper, which we've used quite a bit before. I am nearly out. <laughs> um, so I've got, this is the nine by 12, nine, uh, uh, nine by 11, I mean. Um, is that what it says? Yeah, nine by 12, sorry. Nine by 12 sheets of the gray toned paper. I love this stuff. Um, I do also uh, work with a lot of the Legion, um, cotton rag papers. I love those. We have some tone paper there, but I chose to, to switch to the Strathmore paper today. And I don't really have a great reason. I just wanted to do it. So, <laughs> um, all right. And I chose to work in charcoal. Um, the, the main reason I wanted to work on the toned gray paper is it's going to allow me to create a clear differentiation between the 
the value of the water and the values in the duck. And we're going to be talking about really controlling those value shapes. Um, I'm using, I have two of the black charcoals. I have a, this is the uh, the pit, the Faber-Castell pit. I love this line of charcoals and I also love the general charcoals. They're great. So I have a soft generals. I have the hard Faber-Castell. Um, and then this is a Primo um, white charcoal pencil that's also available at generals that I, I really enjoy this this white pencil. Um, all right, I do have a, I have sticks of compressed charcoal and vine charcoal that I'll be using to block in some of the forms. And then I have my blending stump and of course my handy, um, my Derwent retractable eraser, which I use so much that this is nearly out as well. So I've, this is my second one, um, really powering through these nicely. So um, if you do have any questions, uh, please, if you can try to type them in all caps. I don't view it as though you're yelling at me. It just helps me to identify the questions from the chat. So if I miss a question, please ask it again because um, I would. I'm, I'm doing my best to answer all the questions, and sometimes I just miss them. So all right, welcome everybody. Let's get to it. Um, again, love seeing all the familiar names out there. We got a lot of a lot of us to get together at the same time every week. Um, all right, starting with the gesture drawing, I am going to use the small thumbnail below me. Um, I do have the large one, large reference image up to my left, but right now that's causing more trouble for me. Too big. So I like the small thumbnail to help block in the forms. I actually see the, um, I, I see the, the shapes a bit more accurately. I need to lift my chair up a little bit. There we go. Got to get up over the paper a little bit more. Um, so in this initial pass, I'm just reacting to the form. We, we talk about that a lot in this show. I feel like there might be a little bit more. There it is, a little bit more to the form of the duck. There we go. Um, you get cropped some of that image. Um, again, this is just kind of reacting to the form. I'm trying not to think. And what do we say? I say so much in this show, my general approach is to allow the drawing to emerge at the same um, rate, the same kind of general flow as my observations evolve. I don't, you know, even though I've done this, the preparatory drawing of this duck, I'm approaching this as though I've never drawn it before, which, um, which means my initial impression of this subject is, um, is not very deep. It's a very shallow interpretation of that. And I don't want to be approaching my marks with any degree of certainty or specificity because I don't really know what I'm looking at yet. It's going to take me the entire drawing process to really wrap my head around the subject. Um, if you're approaching your drawing as though um, you have to have it all figured out before you execute on the drawing, uh, it could be challenging. Um, that's a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure for me, so I try to avoid that. Uh, it just takes time to figure out what the form looks like. So I'm kind of moving around, thinking both in terms of line and shape. Squinting your eyes helps to reduce the amount of information that floods through your eyes. Ooh, I don't necessarily like the that texture under there. I'm gonna get a few more sheets of paper underneath. Um, this paper is a little bit thinner. I wanna get uh, a couple more sheets underneath just to, you can see all this this texture here. With the vine charcoal, it's not that big of a, a deal, but um, I think by just having a, a few blank sheets underneath it is going to help tremendously. All right, so at, at, as we've talked about in the, in the past as well, my general approach uh, when I'm using a technique or a process that is familiar to me is to move through the drawing in four main phases. Uh, the, uh, the first phase is this gesture. Sorry, there's something underneath there. Um, the first phase is this gesture. The next phase is to focus on the proportions and correcting the basic structure, the basic framework, um, moving into refinement, and then finally ending with the finishing details. Um, and again, that's, uh, that's the process I really outlined in my book, the See, Think, Draw. There's a link to that if anybody's curious about it. It's not available in print yet, but it is available for pre-order. Um, 
for me, drawing is all about, ultimately, it's about the decisions we make. Right? And we might all make the same decisions, but in different orders, if different order from one another. We might make entirely different decisions. Um, and, you know, we might combine our decisions uh, into, you know, one continual process. We may abandon them sometimes. There, there's no real one way to make it through a drawing. But if we shift our focus to thinking about what decisions are we making about the subject and how are we choosing to apply those decisions in what order and away from technique, it'll often arrive at a deeper understanding of the subject. And the more deeply you understand the subject, it's my belief that the stronger your drawing will be. And that's if you're working from life, but actually if you're working from imagination too, it's the same thing. Um, and often working from your imagination, um, it takes a little bit more time to get at an understanding of the subject you might be thinking about. Um, and that's why working from life can be helpful, even if, you know, even if it's just for the sake of exercise and you're not um, thinking about it as any sort of finished piece of work. Um, working from life allows you to really confront the, the way in which you navigate the drawing and the way you're reacting to it, the decisions that you make as you react to the drawing. Um, and, and I find that it, it just enhances the, uh, the work from imagination as well. So practice is such an essential part of being an artist and... It's my belief that it is a skill that, that requires focus and attention to simply building a healthy habit right? um, and practicing. Sometimes, I know I did this for myself for a long time, I would put so much pressure on myself to execute a drawing the right way every time because I felt like in some way my identity was wrapped up in my ability to make a good drawing. But in order to get there, you've got to make a lot of bad drawings. You've got to make a lot of you got to you got to exercise right and and as part of that exercise it's important that you make mistakes that's how you confront you know certain aspects of your drawing and how you improve um, and so that's what this show is all about really is that we're just we're taking the time to to run through the paces we're doing our exercises now um, see what we can learn and hopefully not get it wrapped up in our own identity too much. Okay, so with this kind of rough gesture, you can see that I've, I'm really just looking for the basic shape of the duck and basic negative space of that water behind there. There's a positive and negative space. It's all very loose. I like wiping it down with a paper towel, and you're going to see me do that throughout the entire process where I'll be making marks and I'll be kind of wiping it down. And every time I do that, it's about unifying the marks, unifying the drawing, and, and arriving at a a greater depth to the marks. Um, now there are some times when I might draw and I'll be intentionally direct and, and try to make marks that are more permanent. Um, but the way I'm working now in order to really study the subject of the duck, I need to, um, I need to do this multiple times. I need to create, uh, you know, multiple foundations and we're going to draw that form over and over and over and over again. Um, each time will be very quick, but each time we do that, it's going to be a little bit more specific. So that's kind of generally my approach. And I, again, I recognize that it might be entirely different from yours, which is why I would love to hear it in the chat. Um, uh, Peter Frost is asking, did I take the photos? I did, I did not take this one. Uh, so in the description below, I credit the photographer from either Unsplash or Pixabay. Um, I, for a lot of the first you know, phases of the episodes. I did take my own photographs that got very time consuming and I'm not a great photographer. <laughs> and in just so many times I can come up with a, a stronger subject. But I do choose the, uh, the subjects from these sites with intentionality, mostly looking for a sense of form and volume. That's a big thing for me because uh, I want to be able to create that form and volume in, uh, in the drawing. And if there's not a really strong sense of light and shadow to reveal that form and volume, then it's we're fighting against that so many times in the drawing. So um, in this case, again, there because there is a noticeable contrast between light and shadow in the subject, um, I found that it's going to be helpful here. Um, and then 
yeah, and I will be, you know, so I'll be really working on the shading and creating that form. Um, what I really love about this is this is going to help us confront that transition from shadow into the edge. Um, and so we're really going to be reinforcing that form through that. We will be looking at kind of lost and found edges and variety there. Um, and, and that's going to, that's going to be helpful. Um, uh, oh, and then Jane, yes, the, the problems on the website should be fixed with regards to fixing uh, or posting the work. It was just this morning. Um, I was communicating with the developers who have that resolved. It was across all of our sites here and our craft sites as well, um, where the images weren't attaching for some reason. And unfortunately, I don't, I, I leave, I leave all those things up to the people who know more about development, but it's working. So um, we should be able to share now. And if you did share from some of the previous assignments or not assignments, episodes, and, uh, it, and it didn't appear, it should be working now. If not, um, let me know and I'll do what I can. Um, all right. Okay, back to it. Rough gesture now moves into, I'm going to calculate. And calculating for me is a very different part of the brain. Um, the, you know, the, the brain, that part of my brain that reacts to the form in the gestural sense um, is thinking more about the whole now, as we look about at the structure, I'm thinking about angles and I'm thinking about proportions. And so as, as many of you who have been with the show for a while, you'll you probably suspect that we're moving into angle sighting. Um, and for me, that starts by um, re really reacting to my own observations. So I'm looking at the basic angle for the back of the duck. I'm looking for the basic angle for that, that front side. Uh, and then it, it kind of turns here, and I'm using the side of the the vine charcoal. The vine charcoal is going to be, it's, it's very fugitive, it's not going to last very long, it wipes away very easily, but I'm not concerned about that. Actually, I want these marks to be um, just temporary. This is more about me, again, if we move into a certain sense of intentionality, me understanding the proportions with greater depth, and I can recall this, recall these these angles and proportions more easily if I lose them later on in the drawing. So what's happening now is I'm thinking largely about kind of the indirect gaze. So what I mean by that is I'm looking at the subject on, on the screen just below me. I'm seeing what you're seeing. I'm being fixed on that subject, but being aware of my peripheral vision, what's happening on the screen, then adjusting my marks accordingly. And then I will compare that using um, angle sighting. And then I will adjust these, the placement of these marks um, as, I, as I apply some additional calculations. And you can see that I'm intentionally running these marks long because again, my focus is on angles, not absolute dimensions yet. And by breaking up a curve into a ser series of shorter, straighter marks, you're going to arrive at a greater degree of specificity to that curve, especially with something like the, uh, the head of the duck. If I were to approach that as a singular curve, my instinct would be to make that as essentially a circle, a, a symmetrical form. and if you look closely at that curve, it's actually, there's a lot of variation in there, and that's what we want to capture. And by breaking it down into these shorter straight sections, it helps to arrive at that a bit more effectively. Okay. Um, let's see. All right. <laughs> I see some of you drawing together, some of you uh, working on a painting. Awesome. Um, and I will be, I'm, I am working on developing more, uh, more content for painting. So I think at, um, some, at some point soon, we're going to be making some changes here um, and, and I'll be able to integrate some painting, and, you know, transitioning from drawing into painting, including drawing as well, but working hopefully with watercolors and oils and pastels and 
and other media so that we can get some variety. Because we're almost up on 150 episodes. We're, we're at 139 here. I can't believe it. Um, let's see. Uh, Peter Frost, how many days should you work on drawing in a week? That's a tough question. Um, uh, I've kind of addressed that before, and I'm trying to think of. I want to. I want to be consistent, so I'm trying to think of how I answered that in the past, because um, I, I do feel like the. You know, of course, the more you draw, the better. You know, the the simple answer is as much as you can. That's how much you should draw. Um, but again, there's also a certain amount of intentionality that can be helpful when learning any new skill. If you're able to move into that skill and practice with intention, you are going to grow faster than if you are kind of randomly making marks on the page. Um, so I think the quality of, of the drawing that you do in terms of the practice uh, plays a role in it. You know, if you have endless hours to commit to drawing every day, that's you're going to boost your skills tremendously. If you are short on hours, though, I would say if you can draw every day, at least for a little bit, that's probably better than kind of hoarding all your drawing time into one day a week. Having said that, that's essentially what I do. <laughs> I draw on Wednesdays, um, and then I do a preparatory drawing. So maybe twice a week, I'm kind of focusing with intention. And when I can, I go out and paint as well. Um, the so if you, I, I would hate anybody to feel like you know they're um, they're doing it wrong in some way if if you're not doing it every day. But if you do have the ability to draw every day, awesome. And if you're able to do it even for twenty minutes a day, that's that's perhaps even better. You know, in a way, I think it, developing a regular habit is ultimately what's most valuable. Um, and the, again, if your, if your time is short, my thought is to prioritize gesture drawing over say, continuing one drawing and working on it a little bit each day. Um, or maybe you alternate. So maybe you take a few weeks where you're just focusing on gesture and then you have one long, more involved drawing, um, just because so much happens in a quick gesture drawing. You're, you're thinking about proportions, you're thinking about hand-eye coordination, reacting to the forms. You know, it's, it's a really valuable drawing skill to focus on, on gesture drawing. Um, and, uh, but like I said, do the best you can, just draw as much as you can. Um, but I think it often gets overlooked. We wanna get to the point of a really nice finished drawing um, and we often overlook the power of gesture drawing. So, um, mad moments go. Got the got the uh, the throw out to Monty Python with the um the, with the the knight would uh, Benavir <laughs> from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. That is the the thumbnail for this image or for this episode. Um, All right. Um, okay, I want to double check some of these proportions. So I'm going to use some angle sighting to do that. And what angle sighting is, if you're new to this whole concept, I'm holding my pencil out in front of the subject in that small thumbnail, closing one eye because that flattens my depth perception. And when I hold my pencil over the reference, it feels like it's directly on top of it. So I'm aligning the, the pencil with the back of the duck, locking my wrist, carrying it so I can see it right on right on top of my drawing, and it feels like I got that angle pretty well. I can do that with the neck. And that looks pretty good. I'm kind of getting in my own way a little bit here. So I'm working around my drawing. I'm checking this angle here, checking the basic angle of the, the point of contact with the water. Checking this basic angle here. And kind of this angle. So looking at that basic form, 
And I think it's really important that to, I need to remind myself that this, these are just guide marks. Nothing is, nothing is permanent here. They're just pointing me in the right direction. Um, <laughs> I could say me. Um, uh, let's see. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I love all the quotes from the Holy Grail. Um, I was thinking about doing a loaf of bread, which we've done before, and then I was going to call it Bring Out Your Bread. Um, let's see. Council of Wolfgang is drawing animals. Really just stick a pencil in your hand and just draw from someone's photo, or would I just be drawing contours and missing fundamentals? Uh, well, I think you bring up a good point about working from photos, and of course I have to work from a photo in this situation. If you can ever draw from life, that's going to be um, – it's going to give you much greater benefit. Um, because of that layer of complexity of translating the three-dimensional form onto a two-dimensional surface. And especially with a living creature that's moving around, it's really wonderful brain training. So if you ever get a chance to do wildlife sketches, um, I highly recommend it. Um, having said that, working from a, a still photo does allow us to explore many issues that are helpful in and improving our drawing. Um, a lot of fundamentals like light, value, shading, texture, composition, and, and proportions. Um, and we've talked about it before, having an anatomical understanding of, of a, whatever subject you have can be very helpful. It can have, lead to a deeper um, expression of the subject. But at the same time, if this is a new form, you can, under, you can come to understand the anatomy through the drawing process. If you're looking at, at the proportions, at the edges, at the value relationships, um, I think it's just a great way to understand the subject with greater depth. Um, so um, the, in this case, I'm actually I'm kind of mapping out some of the basic contours but what you're going to see me do right now is kind of wipe that down. So I have some of those available to me now. A lot of what I just did was for my own mental benefit, not for visualizing what's happening on the page. It's not the framework that I'm going to be drawing from. Um, now I want to be mindful of the relationship between the width and the height. Uh, so I'm going to use some comparative measuring. So what that means is, again, I'm going to close my eye so that I'm flattening my depth perception, placing my pencil so it appears to be sitting directly on top of the reference photo, and I'm taking a measurement of the height of the back. So the top of the pencil aligns with the back of the duck on the reference. I slide my finger down until it aligns with the bottom edge of the duck. That gives me a measurement. And then I can, I can turn it to the side and I can see how many measurements does it take to equal the width? And what I'm seeing is that if this represents the back, I'm going to indicate that, this represents the water line, and I take that measurement, and this represents that back tail, I should be able to get one, two, and the right side here in the water line is just past that. So the, the height equals essentially two and a little bit more to the width. Um, I also want to compare the height to, say, the height of the neck. So let me see that. Yeah, and that's actually a nice relationship. So if I take this height again, and I measure down from the top of the head, it takes me down just about to the base of the neck right around there. So that means that my initial, um, my initial kind of placement, you know, rough as it is, gets me in the ballpark. And in the ballpark is great for now. And we're going to gradually refine those proportions as anything kind of stands out. Um, and then as we go through, I'm going to be looking with greater depth at um, the structure of the head and trying to break that apart even further. So if I know that in general I've put myself in 
a box that is roughly the correct dimension here. Now I can, I can start to subdivide these, uh, these forms even more and focus on each of these elements with a greater de degree of specificity. All right. It's going to tap this out. And then this could be a good, actually, I'm going to use my kneaded eraser to do this. I've kind of stopped using my kneaded eraser so much because it's kind of breaking down. I've been using this kneaded eraser for two years now. Um, we started this show almost exactly two years ago, and I've been using the same kneaded eraser the whole time. Um, I, have, I, had a, I had a second one um, that I was using, and, but it's, it's finally starting to break down. It shows you how many drawings you can get. I've gotten at least you know, a couple hundred drawings now with this, with this one. Um, so just kind of quickly subtractive drawing here. I do want to make a quick note here of the beak as it relates to the front of the duck here. Now, another way to double check your proportions if you're struggling with them um, is to do some angle sighting across some of the forms. So one thing in, in particular that would help is to try to find this angle. If you've indicated either the, the tail feather or the wing feather that sticks out the back and the top of the head, that creates a unique angle. And if I compare that to what I have here, it looks like it lines up well. Uh, I can drop a plumb line down from the end of the beak, see how it relates to the, the front breast here, and the tip of the beak should extend just a little bit out, so I might be able to bring that in a little bit. Okay. So again, a lot of these calculations are for my own mental benefit, and these marks are going to disappear. But because I've gone through this process now, it's going to be a lot easier for me to access as I try to um, so I try to refine these further. Okay. Um, yes, exactly. I love what you're saying, Stephanie, about uh, the birds that you've been seeing. Um, Yeah, I think, and I totally agree. I think if you can ever get out and work from life, I just found, I find so much value in that, both in terms of my drawing as well as just kind of spiritually and emotionally. Um, and then Peter, yes, negative space is incredibly important here. And that's exactly where I'm going to be moving to now. Um, so I'm going to, I have my compressed charcoal stick and this one is relatively hard. Um, and so I want to essentially kind of replace some of the, the marks um, of the vine charcoal with this compressed charcoal now. Um, and one of the reasons I wanted to work in the, the vine charcoal initially is that I find it helps to, um, you know, the, the best term I have for it is season, season the paper. <laughs> it kind of makes it uh, more receptive to the compressed charcoal. Sometimes I find when I go straight to paper with the compressed charcoal, it can be a little aggressive, a little sticky, essentially. And um, so having this layer of vine charcoal underneath it um, is a little bit help, a little helpful. And I'm using a very light pressure on this. And I'm not too concerned about going over the edges. You can see I'm not precious at all with the edges. If anything, I want them to go right over the edge of where I imagine the duck to be. Um, but I want to create a clear value differential between that blue water and the form of the duck. And I know in my head that I'll be able to uh, really pull out some of the brighter whites. Uh, so I have to be careful to some degree about how I'm calibrating to the values. So we again, we, we talk about this a lot. So if you're new, um, what I'm talking about is the idea that we understand values really only as as a relationship between light and dark. 
you know, we can recognize there's a dark value, a light value, but we, when we, when it comes to specificity and really trying to lock in values, it has, it, it's all about the relationship between them. We don't have as humans the ability to understand a value in isolation. You know, it's not as like a similar equivalent to perfect pitch in music. Um, our eyes just aren't capable of doing that because it's just not how they work. They, um, they work on contrast. And so as a result, value is – there's so much illusion that happens when we're studying values, whether how dark or how light something is. Um, and what is happening for me now, and it may be for you as well, is my, my brain is starting to latch on to the idea that this is white. You know, because part of what happens is that we we can interpret light and shadow effect as well as local value or local color. So a local color, local value is the color or the value of the object really as unaffected by light. Um, and then – but then you have the perceived value, the perceived color that is that is affected by light and shadow. We kind of adjust our understanding of those colors and values based on our understanding of the light structure, the light logic. Um, if you think about, you know, several years back, there was that whole kerfuffle with the blue dress. Some people seeing it as gold and blue and black and white, or I can't remember how it was organized. But that had a lot of that had to do with, um, you know, some of uh, some of our brains and uh, prioritizing the local color and local value, and others um, applying a sense of light logic to it. And when we do that. It, it affects our perception of that value. Um, so, part of that part of that whole process is a sense of calibration, where we look at the darkest area, we look at the lightest area, and we have a, um, a natural tendency to say, "All right, now this is darkest, so that's black. This is lightest, so that's white." Um, and then, as we go darker on the black, we realize that this is actually quite light in terms of its gray. And as we go lighter in this area, it provides enough contrast for us to see that this is actually a gray, closer to a middle gray than um, that it is closer to white. So uh, I bring that up because it can be dangerous when you're trying to create a sense of realism to identify with specific values too early. So, all right, now. What do I want to do? I want to keep working on um, – let's see. Uh, just uh, – just, sorry, looking at, the, at some of the comments there and I, I want to make sure I'm not missing any, um, any questions. I'm going to keep working on the background though. So now I'm not worried too much. I shouldn't be using my fingers. I'm not too worried about this area because then what we're going to be doing – I'm kind of hesitant to use this because it's nice and sharp and I don't want to ruin my sharp edge on my, ra on my eraser. So let me pull out – let me pull out a different one that's not sharpened. This Factus eraser. These are, these are really good. Um, but you can see that it erases pretty well. All right. So I can get that sharp edge. I'm not worried about that. So um, the reason I'm focusing on the background is I want to ensure that there is a clear division between the angle of the plane of the water and then the angle of the duct. There's kind of a perpendicular quality. We're looking at down at an angle. So there's – from our point of view, there's kind of a slant to the water and the duct kind of slanting upward like this. Now, if I – if I'm working on the background, working in this negative space, and I'm not careful to make sure that they align, it can really disrupt things in the viewer's mind. <laughs> so um, it, it throws things off where we start to see this as being different from this. And so much of that has to do with what's called the law of good continuation. It's a gestalt principle in design. The, the idea that you know, if I were to say I draw a line here and then it picks up and it appears to connect through and connect through here, even though these are literally three different marks, they appear to be belong together. If I – and I didn't do a very good job drawing those, but if I go like this, if I have this line here and then I drop a line down in here, 
and then this is going like this, now I have three spaces that feel very different from one another. This is a kind of an exaggerated expression of that. Um, and so by kind of knowing roughly where the duck is going to be, I can focus largely on the structure of the water. And I'm not going to spend too much time really rendering it, um, but I do want to kind of pay attention to the rough, um, kind of the, the rough observations I'm making about, this, about the surface. W what I can see is just based on the angle, um, you know, we actually have kind of a, a bit of a curve that's happening here because of how close the photographer was to the duck. So we're looking more down at this water than we are up here, where we start to look more across it. So as a result, here they, these marks tend to kind of squish together. We see tighter marks that then open up as we come down here a bit more. And so as I react very gesturally to these forms, of really all I'm doing is, is kind of holding that observation in my mind. I'm, I'm, I don't want to get too um, wrapped up in the specifics of it, of, of really drawing the water. I want to really just arrive at a, a, a clear gestural understanding of that water. Oop, my shadow was blocking that form. I see these reflections in here, which are kind of interesting. I'll have to address those. Oop, I gotta be careful of the direction of my marks. Um, and then now I'm also observing that, you know, the surface of the water is being affected by the, by the duck itself. These, we get these kind of radiating rings of um, little waves, little disruptions in the surface kind of working around the form of the duck. And so if we were to imagine, say, a, an oval extending behind the duck, it gets obscured and it starts to come out right about here. And then we see other, other rings that are kind of obscure, uh, obscured by the back of the duck. And then that, you, again, as subtle as it is, will help to visually imply that that kind of perpendicular orientation of the duck to the water. Let me um, get rid of this. Now it's too sharp, so I'm so I'm being really rough with this, but hopefully it's going to come out more cleanly. Ooh, it's already 45 minutes in, so I need to pick up the pace. No time to dilly dally because I want to. I really want to get into kind of the, the details of the duck there. I'm going to um, run some vertical marks. Actually, what I'm going to do is now as I'm wiping this down, being a little bit more um, precise with it, but not super precise. All right, and I think what I want to be, one of the things that I want to drive my understanding of the water around is if, I, if you look at, if you, you put your center of focus on the duck, but put your awareness on the value of the water, what happens is that this really dissolves into a singular value. If you focus on the water, you start to see these distinct bands of kind of lighter and darker areas. Um, and especially around this area, it's going to be, it's a bit more delicate. So if I, if I enhance the contrast in the water too much, it's, it's going to just make it harder to interpret the form. So I'm going to kind of default to kind of a lower amount of contrast in this area. And now in, in a, like area in the foreground, I can look for some of those light areas 
and start to suggest the ripples in the water. And it's a very light pressure at first because I wanted to see what uh, what lifts kind of naturally with that. And I'm observing that there's kind of a hard edge quality to some of these reflections. And there's also kind of an irregularity. Um, if I'm trying not to think about kind of stripes, it's so easy to do this, especially up in this area. So I'm going to try to break that up a bit. Variety is really a key thing. And you can see I'm picking up a lot of the charcoal on this eraser, and that's actually helpful because it's just smudging a little bit first, and then if I need to lift more, I can start to bear down. But it allows me to kind of visualize some of these forms a little bit. Before I, um, before I really execute on them. And there's kind of a bigger wave back here. Now, um, let's see. So this isn't, isn't done, but now I, hopefully I have enough of it kind of established that I can, um, I can come back to it later. Uh, you know, I can you know, be able to add more detail to some of these reflections if I need to. And now I can work on the form of the duck. I mean, I'm actually going to kind of erase this down a little bit. And I'll use my, my kind of sharpened eraser. Actually, I'm going to, you see I have two edges. I have, I have it cut to this chisel tip. I want to preserve this edge for my finer details. So I can, on this kind of rough pass, use the backside. And it gives me kind of a sharp edge, but it's not super precise. bigger eraser here, so I'm using the smaller eraser for the finer edges, the larger eraser for these the bigger in the central area. And I realize now I took a lot more time on that preparatory drawing than I <laughs> than I'm gonna have here. Um, oh I do want to uh, see if there's any questions. Um, Uh, Rianne and P, do you always use mid values? Um, no, not necessarily. Um, I think you're, you're raising a good, um, you know, good question. It, it kind of about the key of the drawing. Um, you know, that's a term that we haven't really used much here, but the um, the idea of high key versus low key. Uh, when it comes to value, what we mean by a high key drawing, the values are generally lighter in, val uh, the, in value contrast, and a, a low key is generally, it tends toward the darks. Um, and, but I, I do think when you're talking about mid values, um, within a high key or a low key drawing, or if you're going to ex expand the full um, full range of values, being mindful of where the darkest darks and the lightest lights are can be very helpful. Um, and that's, an, that's something that took me quite a while to really wrap my head around as I would, um, I would have, I would, I would tend towards a higher key image and, and I would not have a su sufficient amount of contrast uh, between the, the lights in the drawing. 
um, just basically I'd have too many highlights competing with one another. And so in this drawing, I'm going to try to be very mindful of that. Uh, so I think if you're able to, I'm able to create a stronger sense of form and volume by having a majority of the drawing and the subject be, you know, somewhere in the middle and then really preserving the darkest darks and the lightest lights for a very small um, area in the drawing. All right, so as I'm looking through this, this form, I'm gonna, the, the head of the duck, you can start to see um, kind of this distinct plane, this kind of more frontal plane that, that originates with this kind of elliptical form. Let me see this other plane. Um, and what can be helpful is to try to visual, uh, envision, invisualize, I almost created a whole new word, invisualize <laughs> uh, that, that plane that kind of wraps up and around and, and becomes obscured around the back of the head right, right about this point. Um, and then it's kind of rounded in this way as well. And I'm going to be describing that more later on, but... I'm just kind of making these observations, holding it in a mental bank. So when I come back to creating highlights, it will, um, will be helpful. Um, but I, I think um, what might be, um, uh, uh, Rhiannon, what your, your comment might also be uh, kind of addressing is, um, that for the purposes of this show, I try to I try to um, shake it up each episode. You know, so we'll do some episodes where we're working on the white paper with either graphite or charcoal. Some we're working on toned paper or even black paper. Um, and and all of those allow us to confront the issue of of tone. Um, in a different way, if that makes sense. So I'm just going to kind of darken this area a little bit more. Because so I had that light area that... So I'm going to bring in that background right in on top of the beak so that I, can, I have kind of a clean um, edge. Ooh, that, that didn't work. <laughs> that was not a very controlled mark. That's all right. One of the things I love about drawing, we've talked about this before in the show, is 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 when you can you can kind of sense the fight in the drawing. And there's part of me every time I draw that tries to identify with those early experiences in drawing when I'm just trying to figure out how the materials work and how the whole process works, that sense of discovery. Now, let me see if I can refine the shape of the beak a little bit more. So again, that with that beak, just like other curves in the drawing, trying to break it down into a sequence of shorter, straighter marks. Um, and what this is a really nice complex form I think would be great for uh, anybody who's wanting to practice figure drawing. The human figure has similar kind of compound curves. Um, saying, should you add very light lines to help with perspective like the water goes up, like the ring lines of the waves as you add a horizontal line? and then align in the direction of where the water is going to. It can be helpful. Um, and that, I think that's, a, a, again, another really good question um, because you're going to find uh, different approaches to it depending on your resources. Um, you know, you're going to find some instructors, you know, books or videos that will kind of really focus on creating 
a, a foundation and kind of an armature using lines as you're describing. Um, I think that the key thing is that you're aware of those. And so dropping those lines on the page might help someone um, kind of maintain focus on the basic axis, the basic plane of the water, basic plane, vertical nature of the duck. Um, I don't believe you have to have it on the drawing, though. It's, again, it just has – having an awareness of it can be really ultimately the, the, the helpful aspect of it. So kind of whatever works for you. Um, what I have found, though, is when working with light lines, if you use an overhand grip, it tends to make lines that are easier to erase. And so if it's not a line that you want to keep in your drawing, then use an overhand grip. So holding your, holding your pencil like this, where the side of the pencil kind of scrapes across the page, rather than like this, where the tip of the pencil um, kind of embosses on the surface. So hopefully that makes sense. There we go. So what I also like about this subject and this, what I wanted to focus on here is the aspect, the, the process of subtractive drawing. Uh, so here using the eraser to capture form. So I'm going to rough out the shape here. Um, and as I always say, it can be helpful to um, be decisive about um, your threshold for accuracy. So what I mean by that is um, before you before you get too far, just at least consider how accurate your drawing needs to be. Um, and if, if it needs to be 100% accurate, if it just needs to be in the ballpark, um, if it needs to, if you're, if you're good with like 60%, 70% accuracy, um, again, having a certain amount of intentionality behind that can be really helpful. Um, I don't know. I think in general, I'm probably around 75% accuracy is where I feel comfortable. You know, if I can hit a higher degree of accuracy, that's better, but I'm not going to worry about it too much. All right. So I'm going to make some kind of adjustments to the negative space here to refine the angle of say, this tail feather. And, you know, at this point, I think I'm just going to call it generally good enough because I want to move on to some of the, the, um, the finer aspects of the drawing. But if you're not really satisfied with the overall um, shape of your, your duck, keep working back and forth between the positive and negative space. Um, let's see. Um, now I think what... Um, Uh, Rand is saying, would you use a fan brush to, um, yeah, I have, I just, it's, it, I get lazy and I don't, <laughs> I don't often have all the tools available to me that I should have. Um, you know, you can kind of flick it off. I'm not, I'm not very precious with my drawings, but if you are, um, and you're worried about smudging or if you're worried about sp spittle droplets, then, um, use a tool that's going to write for you. All right, so now, you know, I've, I may have, you know, cut out, uh, you know, erased off too much form. So again, I can kind of move back and forth between the positive space and the negative space. Now, to help me identify the form, I, you can see all sorts of subtlety happening in the form of the duck. And I'm going to use my blending stump to help me with this. It's just kind of a gentler way of making a mark. And you can see that this is a well-used one. I kind of pushed in the tip so much that <laughs> like this is really well used. My hands are all dirty. This thing is all dirty. And I love that about blending stumps. 
Um, so I'm going to use this to try and indicate some of these forms. Now, as you look at the, the feathers here, uh, I'm not thinking, again, about absolute values. I'm thinking about just general form. And I'm trying to really observe this kind of shape to the form. If you were to imagine a kind of a center line across here, um, you know, what shape would that take? And I'm going to adjust, I'm going to adjust this as I'm looking at it. Let's see if that's any better. Um, one of the things that I was starting to observe is that in general, you can see this this continuation here from the back of the duck down into into this uh, the the chest area. The, um, so so now I'm trying to visualize kind of this plane here across the top. We kind of turn. There's kind of an angled area. It. Let's see, it's kind of rounded here. It's kind of vertical right in here. It's kind of rounded there, but generally a vertical plane in here. And then almost kind of a triangular shape here in the front. And then we really get distinct kind of cylindrical marks here. So, um, in terms of kind of visualizing underlying shapes, you can see I arrived at that point fairly late in the drawing process, whereas, you know, some people might, you might want to have that earlier on. You might want to establish that armature. This, oh, this doesn't quite fit. There we go. Um, I'm going to actually work down here, pick up some more charcoal. I'm going to roll the, the, the blending stump in my fingers as I do this so that I'm distributing the charcoal fairly evenly and then get back to drawing here. Now one of the things that I, I observe is a general shape here where it becomes a little bit more rounded. And then the, when the, the eye comes in, it's, it's almost like there's a shift to a vertical plane here, wrapping up around that side. And again, none of these marks are going to really be permanent, but I want to just to start to add a little bit more information here that then I can go in and refine further. Um, now, one of the things I observe in the, the beak here is that it really becomes um, planar here. You can see a more distinct kind of flat plane here. It changes direction. And as we come down towards the beak, it all kind of merges at this flatter transition area. Okay. I mean, here really falls into shadow a bit more, but that edge becomes more visible along this edge here. All right. Now I can go back in and add a little bit more specificity to some of these marks. And you can see I'm, I'm using this overhand grip of the Blending stump intentionally, again, it makes just for a more kind of gentle mark. And it's a way for me to bring a little bit more focus to some of these subtle areas here. Um, and there may be too much contrast. I may have to lift off some of these because, I, 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 uh, again, I don't have the white um, added yet to give me that context in terms of values. Um, one of the things, now that like this pass here, I want to start thinking about just the general flow of these really fine feathers here. Um, 
and I can indicate that with the blending stump. You know, so we notice here on the neck, for example, there's kind of a downward diagonal um, kind of expression there. Uh, it seems to change direction here on that back. The direction of your marks can really say a lot. And we've said this before in the show, but again, for the benefit of anybody who's new, um, if I could distill you know, the decisions we make as artists down to two, if I could say, hey, you could only have two things you're going to use to make decisions uh, about the subject on. Think about shape. What shape is it? And what direction do I need to make my mark? You can get so much described just by that by that pairing of decisions. What is the shape and what is the direction of the mark? All right. Jerry's welcome. Uh, Peter Frost, what is my favorite drawing tool? You know, I think when it comes down to it, just, you know, if I could choose one, if I could only have one thing to draw with, it'd be just a regular yellow number two pencil. Um, or, you know, a, a pencil from Jerry's from your sets, one of those says on sets. I love these guys. Perhaps a, a mid range, just a single pencil from a set like this. Um, you know, somewhere in the middle, you can see how much of these pencils I've used. Um, just a pencil. You can describe so much from that. If I could find a sheet of paper even or something else, that would be it. Um, and that's what I, I love about drawing. You know, you, you can take it to a number of levels, um, but it can also be simplified down to the simplest of, um, of materials. You know, I've done here in Colorado, we've had lots of forest fires. It's easy to go for a hike, come across a burnt out tree, pick up a chunk of charcoal and start drawing with it, right? Um, there's that, that, that raw human impulse is to, to make marks that we can all connect with. Um, that, would, that would probably be it. If anybody else has one that you want to throw out there, that's a really great question. Um, oh, looks like Gail has some trouble there. Um, well, hopefully your, your granddaughter, maybe she'll, she'll join in on the episode if she keeps FaceTiming you. Um, oh, <laughs> is that you afraid of low? Okay. Um, divide the image in half vertically. Then, this is what Stephanie's saying. Divide the image in half vertically, then think of it as a diagonal composition sloping from orange beak to orange reflection in the water. But think of the reflection as a Vermeer tapestry, eye candy. Interesting. That's a really good uh, observation. That reflection is going to be really interesting as we get to it. Um, you can see right now I have a bit of a disconnect here between this form and that shadow underneath. Um, so I need to kind of refine that a little bit farther. But um, I want to be thinking about that as we, especially as we address the feet there. Um, OK. So let's get back to this. Uh, one of the things I want to observe is uh, this subtle shadow here. So this, like I said, this is going to give us a real good opportunity to explore edge variation, um, you know, especially as we as we wrap around the form of the duck. What are we doing to really enhance that? that shift um, that describes the volume of the duck. So, all right, now the harder, harder charcoal I'm going to go through and just lightly kind of refine that edge. Um, and I'm using the harder charcoal just because it's not as dark. Um, and I'm using a very light touch just to kind of sharpen up the edge where I can. And as I'm moving along this edge, I'm not drawing a single line that moves down here. I'm thinking about what information the, the reference is giving me about the direction of the fur and what's happening along that edge. 
uh, and that it changes slightly, the edge changes slightly on this section of the neck versus the top of the head. Uh, and I will go back in, I think I'm gonna have to do some more work on the water area. All right, so what I'm observing is really kind of the crown of the head is back here. So if I were to visualize um, kind of a crosshairs across the top of the head, it might follow along a, a path like this, right? Um, and, and then it kind of rounds out if I were to do another crosshairs across here. We're starting to see a form kind of like that. And now I can look here and I can see a little bit of that white feather. There's a, a kind of a bump here. There's a form change right along there. The um, the, the point of contact between the beak and um, the, the feathers here kind of flattens out across there, and that's a little bit too strong of a line, but I would need to visualize it. And then so rather than a, that kind of U-shaped curve that I'm visualizing, um, I'm trying to visualize it as more of a rectangular form. And then the slope here helps to indicate the slope of the beak. So now switching to the negative space of the beak, essentially. Um, uh, Stephanie, I, I agree with your, um, your comments about the, the head and the beak really being the center of attention. So I think I'm going to refine that to a greater degree than other areas. But I, I am, I'm curious, too, what, what you think and what everybody else thinks about uh, when I get into the value shifting, using that contrast to kind of play with that. So we'll have the refined areas pulling attention, but we'll also have value contrast. So um, if I increase the value here, like we're seeing in the reference photo, that's gonna pull away from the duck. So then if I increase the value contrast here, it'll bring us back to that. So I'll be balancing those two, um, and I'd love to get some observations from you all about how that's working for you. Um, yeah, as, as we go along. All right, this is really interesting here, the way the, the feathers come in, you know, just really that, that point of contact with the beak. Uh, really dark in here, I can lean in on it a little bit more. And then I'm just gonna be really light with the pressure. Actually, I think this is too kind of blotchy in here for me right now. So, What do we want to do? Let me finish with the beak first. So what I'm seeing now, and as we refine the beak further, are these compound curves. Um, we're seeing it change shape here where it enters the skull, um, and then it has a distinct curve that comes down the length of it that seems to be connected more with like the central ridge. And then it changes just slightly right around this point where it flattens out to form the bill a little bit more. So it's all very subtle, but if you can observe essentially three main angles to this backside of the beak, it'll create a shape that is a bit more specific than what I had earlier. And now the same is true here. We have this essentially kind of a lip to the beak it kind of comes out and it looks like it almost wraps underneath um, that form. And I want to be mindful, where's the center of the beak? The center of the beak kind of comes in here. It kind of hooks down.
and I'm observing a nice clean highlight right here that I'm going to have to, again, take note of as, um, as I bring in the white charcoal a little bit later. I bring out the blending stump, smooth this out a little bit. And I want to add that little, little nostrilly hole here. So if I come down to about here, just eyeballing it, but you might want to measure a little bit more, a little bit sharper on that back end. Just a light touch to refine that form. Deborah is saying, defining the beak helps a lot. My duck was starting to look like a horse head. Oh, so, um, and Dita saying the la the back is too long for you, huh? Yeah, I, and I may have to make some adjustments to my own as well. And once as I set the anchor of um, the the head. All right. So now I want to place the eye, kind of visualizing it relative to some of these key points here. Now, the, the thing about the eye that I really want to pay attention to is what holds it into the form of the head are, again, just like in the beak, all of these subtle changes to the form. It's not a circle. The, the, the eye is a sphere, but it's also interacting with the structure of the skull and the form of the fur. So it's kind of more rounded on this backside. We're seeing more of its volumetric form, but it's got kind of an, it's almost pinched here in the middle, it's rounded, but it's got more of a distinct angle, kind of flattens out here. And then it almost flattens out at the top as well. Um, and that's with the, the um, the harder charcoal, and now let's see. I'm going to kind of suggest some of the the shading right behind the eye that indicates that change in the plane. Now I want to get rid of these. Rid of those marks. So when I'm using the eraser, I'm trying to describe something about the form, not just cleaning it up, but what can I describe about the form? In this case, I can describe the direction of the feathers, the way they kind of wrap up and tuck behind the head right at about that point. And I have to look at the, the drawing in front of me. I, because I'm at the angle that I am here, oriented to the, the drawing, everything looks all screwy. Um, I'm, let's see. I need to refine the, the head a little bit more. And the back, the neck. I don't think I... I don't think it's quite big enough. I think it's a wider form, just eyeballing it. And I should measure, but I want to move this thing along. So just pushing that back out, making it a little bit wider back there. Um, okay. I'm just looking at the relationship between this back tail and the um, the beak there. All right. I'm gonna refine this even farther. I just need to. I think I just need to. That it just wasn't wide enough there. And then these feathers really wrap up around that edge. These guys kind of stick out into that water form. OK, 
Okay, back to the harder pencil. Just trying to be more specific with the shading in here. And I'm going to actually mix some of this with the white to bring the values up a little bit later as well. These, um, I think I almost need to bring in the white pencil sooner than later and really work the two together. And I think one of the things I also want to do is kind of wipe the whole drawing down. Soften the edges a little bit. And then I can come back in with this and create more value contrast again, redefine it. So don't be afraid to um, yeah, kind of just wipe it all down and build it back up again. Um, And kind of got too close to the drawing, started to get into the form a bit too much. And it just helps to, I don't know, rein myself in a little bit more. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, let me bring in the white. I'm going to start working with the white on here. Um, and I think that will really help to refine this. So again, using the overhand grip. Uh, I'm trying to think about essentially the two planes. There's a direction of the feathers and then running across the cross contour of that plane uh, with a broad stroke. And that will hopefully give me the, the form and volume that I need. And I'm going to just start with the lightest pressure possible and then uh, increase it as I need to go. Now, I can also use this as a way to kind of blend. So using the circular motion here, you can start to blend it with the charcoal that's on the page. And what's nice about that is that you're going to again then get a, a contrast in temperature, kind of a slightly blue quality or slightly cooler quality to the gray and white mixture. And we see a change in plane here. Actually, I want to... Smooth that out if it's too kind of blotchy. And now I want to really want to observe the structure of the head. So generally, you see kind of lighter areas at the changing of the planes. You know whether it's at a, in a convex kind of point in a curve or a concave. Uh, and if you're not really quite sure what direction to make your marks, just start throwing in circular mar marks, omnidirectional marks there. So I'm just thinking a little bit more, a little bit harder now than I was earlier. And if you need to lighten up the whole area, you can provide a, you know, give it a nice little wash with the white charcoal. I do like there's a little bit of bounce light on the back of the head that I can enhance with 
kind of a lighter edge. And as we come in under here, actually uh, there's a little bit of a bounce light right in here, catching on that form. And I'm just trying to be mindful of how hard the edges are in some of these areas. Um, and make sure that I'm keeping these soft transitions. If I'm too hard, then it's going to make the duck feel more angular than it is. We're going to lose that quality. But if we don't have enough contrast, then it may not have that sense of form and volume that we were really going for. Before I get too much farther along, I'll um, add a little bit more structure to the beak, bring out some of that contrast. We talked about that really bright highlight right in there. Sometimes what you can do if you need a really bright highlight, it's kind of just a little bit of water uh, there with a the charcoal pencil. But I don't try to do that. I don't know. That's probably not the safest thing I've ever done, so just be careful. And then with this white charcoal too, you can also use it, if you're using it gently, to sharpen up an edge. Um, so you may not be affecting the value a whole lot, you're just kind of sharpening that edge. All right. Uh, Rihanna is asking a question if I'm going to use the blending tool on the white. I, I'm actually I'm going to be really careful because this is loaded up with with uh, dark charcoal, and I usually have one that I use for white. Is that it? Is this it? Oh, here it is. Good question. So uh, um, I have a separate one that I'll use for some of the white blending tool um, to soften up some of that area. Um, and now I may have to, have to come back into this a little bit later once I get these areas here that are really bright. Um, let me move down the neck a little bit. So, um, and when you're working on the shading, I find that it's really helpful to have a small thumbnail of the reference to use to refer to the overall light and shadow structure because with a large reference, um, it's really easy to prioritize detail over light and shadow. And that kind of, we actually become less skilled at observing value relationships when we're really focused on detail. So um, having a small, uh, a small thumbnail and avoiding the detail, squinting your eyes is another way to do that, um, is a great way to really um, make your decisions about value relationships and overall structure. Now, um, around with the neck here too, you can start to see kind of bands of feathers that seem to wrap around. Um, there's almost like a, if you envision a central axis here, um, you can start to see how it how it really wraps around. Um, now the, the the challenge though, and this is something that I, I'm fighting, and I'm saying it really probably more for my benefit than anything, just be careful not to create stripes around there. And this is one of the hard things that I have is when I notice something subtle, my tendency is to overstate it. So I'm trying not to do that. Um, all right, so I'm gonna switch back to the overhand grip. Now the benefit here is to, as I build up these larger areas of light and shadow, um, and if I'm using this overhand grip, it uh, it sharpens the pencil for me. So then I have um, I have a, a sharp point when I need the detail, and I need to sh shift to a, a uh, an overhand grip. So as I come down along this side, I really want to I want my marks to kind of start originate at the edge of the form where it wraps around, and then come into the center. So rather than one line that 
traverses that whole edge, I'm breaking that apart into these marks that, again, they, they originate at that edge, but then carry down into the center. And that'll be ultimately more volumetric than um, uh, working, you know, with a, a hard contour edge there. I'm going to use the broad area here to, to kind of suggest the plane along the front. Changes planes here. And then we can see at the transition from the kind of the cylinder of the neck into the body, there's that, that change in plane and the light's really catching in there. But before I get that, I'm going to um, kind of build up some of the values around it. Uh, yeah, Jane has some good observations, and I think, Stephanie, you've had some good ones as well about the overall form, um, and those are all good things for me to have in mind as I get to finishing some of those areas, so thank you for that, uh, calling out kind of the overall proportions and the forms and some of the rest of the duck, which as long as I'm in the ballpark now, I'm being in good shape, but I still do question this overall form. I need to, might need to adjust that shape along the back. And I think I want to kind of enhance that, that the quality of the that shadow that seems to cross over the duck because I like the way it reveals some of the form, the idea of almost a stripe of shadow crossing over it. It's really interesting. So I want to want to keep that as I move in this area. It's really just a light touch. I think I'll just create a bit of a wash across the whole form. Super light. And as I get into the area where I want the light to be stronger, just leaning in on it more. And I can use the blending stump if I need to. How are we doing on time? I think we're doing all right. Ariana is saying, what is the paper? It is uh, the Strathmore gray-toned paper. It comes in the, it's a nine by 12 pad that, um, uh, that I just ripped the page out of. So in this section here, I'm just really utilizing the, the white more as a way to sharpen the edge than anything. Um, and I'm trying to be mindful of it not it it not being a, a hard edge. Let's see. So just taking multiple passes with the white. And I, I'm really trying to, when I look at it, the screen, it helps me to observe it as though it's from a distance. Um, and that really helps me to, to keep a check on the amount of kind of detail in the drawing. So I, I want to suggest the feathers. I don't want to be too um, hard on the details there. So by lightening here, it helps to increase the, the sense of form and volume. Uh, there's a... Um, kind of an angular quality too into the shadow as well that so just using the white again as a way to blend 
So again, this one of the reasons I selected this is because of its subtlety and the, the, the way we can practice with intentionality to control the edges of our gradations. Um, We're doing about an hour and a half. We should be able to finish on time. We generally generally try to do about two hours for this show here. Um, and I'm, I think I'll have to I may come back to this area a little bit. One of the challenges I'm facing right now is I really want to move the paper, but I can't because it's taped down. Um, so that's kind of a pain. But um, well, that's all right. That's just the way it works. And if you go too light, don't be afraid to, you know, use the eraser to lift in certain areas. Um, and uh, let me see. Uh, this this shadow area needs to be refined. Uh, and what I what I need to do is. Um, just kind of break up that that shape a little bit. There's this kind of a ledge underneath here. There's a shadow that cuts in underneath here. And I really want to focus on this kind of general plane under here. And if you take another pass with, say, the, the harder charcoal pencil like I'm doing now, then um, just like with the white, it can be a great way to kind of blend a little bit. So And they give a little bit more depth to some of these shadow areas. Actually, I'm going to come with my darkest charcoal right here. You can see how much darker that is. I think that's helpful. Um, Figure out where I want to have the darkest darks to pull out a little bit more contrast. And maybe even along the edge here, to kind of pull the, the head of the duck off a little bit from up from the water a bit more. And actually, I'm going to use this to Darken some of that beak. If I really want to bring that beak out even farther, I have that highlight there. If I drop in a darker value next to it, increase the contrast in that area, that should bring that forward some more. Especially right in here, I think I want to Sharpen that edge with a line to, to bring more definition to that. Um, oh, yeah, I'll work on the reflections here. Why don't I do that, actually? I'll bring out the softer charcoal right in along in here. And in particular, this is a, a really nice reflection to work on. Um, and there's this really beautiful kind of broken quality to this edge that gives some form to the, the duck right in here. You can see that it's a bit of a kind of a dip. And so as I, as I work along that edge, it's all relatively dark, but I want to vary up my marks. You know, some of them follow along that path. Some of them are kind of follow along the texture of the duck a little bit more. 
Um, But in general, like from that edge, I'm going to really drag down and see how that works. Um, and there's some really just kind of beautiful, kind of subtle textures to the water in there. And then right up along this edge, kind of a sharper transition. And to the, the darker value there. Um, now I'm gonna before I before I transition all the way across here, I want to see where that foot is that we can see through the water. And we're gonna um, indicate that. And as I look at the larger scale, um, the, the reference photo, you can see that these darker areas reveal the, the, a reflection in the, the, the direction of the feathers, the, the grain of the feathers. And I'm leaving some of this area a little bit light because um, there's, it, it's, I'm trying to understand what that is. It's not a, a perfectly hard edge. It's really kind of dark up in this area. But as we come around, it lightens just a little bit in this area where more of the light from the duck is reflected. Okay. Uh, now I'm um, using just kind of positive and negative space to reveal the foot that's under the water there. Really dark back up in this section. So I'm just going to kind of suggest some of that in there for now. Let me zoom back out. It feels like, oh, it's gotten kind of darker in this room. Let me pump up the, the contrast just a little bit. Um, let me see, and I'm going to use my eraser to give a little bit more form and substance to the foot, and then it overlaps with the reflection of the highlight in the duck. And as I'm, as I'm looking at the reflection in the water, trying to correlate it with the specific object that's above water, but, you know, it's a... It's reflecting from a different point of view. The eyes, we're looking down at the water, it's reflecting back up. So you're seeing kind of the underside of, of some of these forms a little bit more. So it's not a perfect kind of reflection from top to bottom because the reflection captures a different viewpoint of the same objects. Okay. And I think what I want to do is kind of enhance some of the, the light in here that I, I see more clearly in the larger reference, kind of correlating it with the, the brighter spots there. All right, 
So hopefully that looks okay. Got some of those reflections in there. Um, I'm going to, we'll come back to this, but I want to, um, I want to start to refine some of these areas. So I don't want to mess this up and I really want to rest my hand on this, <laughs> but I can't. So the technique I'm going to use is this kind of modified grip where I have my, you see I have my pinky, I can stabilize here. Let me see if I can tilt that down like that. You see that it's resting on the page, kind of more on my, my thing, fingernail, and that gives me a little bit more precision as, as I look to um, really kind of refine some of these edges. And the same can be true with the eraser. You know, if you have a you know, sheet of mylar or something that to protect it, that could be helpful. But I find that that technique generally works. Um, and um, I can also use the table here to rest my arm. That gives me a little bit of support as well. So I don't have to rest my hand on the table. Um, but I do feel like I have to contort things a little bit. Um, I do want to refine the negative space in here a little bit more. It's a small area. But um, I think it's an important one. I'm actually going to smooth that all out, and I'll have to keep reworking that positive and negative space in here. But there's this kind of looks like a handle to a mug or something right in here. Um, let me get it. Yeah, mad moments go. I wish I had them all stick. I've never been able to really get to use, like, get comfortable using them all stick. Um, I've just, I spent so many years finding workarounds that I'm just kind of more comfortable with those, I, I suppose. But a mall stick is a fantastic tool. And part of me gets anxious trying to be too precise. Oh, wrong one. I'm going to use the hard one. There's this nice little negative space. Right in there. And so I use the eraser to kind of erase out the foreground uh, wing. And then we get these cool little bands of the, um, the shadows there of the wings. I'm going to bring out the blending stump, use this to really define some of the form more than the charcoal. But I do think I need to bring out the, the white. Okay. Now I need to, this is where I'm going to adjust the, that back wing a little bit more. Giving it a little bit more form. And all right, let's bring in some of this, this white charcoal. So just similar to what I was doing over here, I, I don't want to create a strong contour line. So if I, you know, for example, follow along this edge in one go, I want to be mindful of how that form wraps up into that edge. So I think the, this, this technique of using the side of the pencil is, is helpful for doing that. And I'm allowing it to just roll in my fingers as I go, and that helps to prevent kind of any um, flat spots. And then the highlight 
on this wing is, is inset from that edge just a little bit to round it to help create that, that rounded edge. And we'll do the same over on this side here. Here the light is catching really more on this side, so I can bear down a little bit more. <laughs> And I'll move across the contour of that back feather, the back wing. I really love the way the light is catching on this back wing here. Can suggest some of the direction of the feathers. And then there are these just these subtle variations that reveal some of the, the patterns in the feathers, like right in here. Um, actually, then we have this form in here. I'm going to start with the light kind of in that negative space along that back side. And then I can come back into this and create that smoother transition. So I'm going to use the circular kind of mark here just to help to, again, create a smoother gradation between the light and dark on this side. Uh, Rhiannon is asking if I'll use a fixative, and I will not use a fixative. Um, I, I just generally, I don't. These are all exercises, um, so I'm not concerned with preserving this at all. Um, but if I if I didn't want to preserve it, I would I would probably actually want to keep it in some sort of um, like a mylar bag or something rather than spray fix it um, and keep it stored flat. Um, just because the spray fixatives I've found have kind of altered the value the value structure, it can increase the contrast. And if I were to frame it, it might be a good idea to, to fix it, depending on how you're having it framed. And if you have a, if you have a good custom framer that you're comfortable with, um, you know, letting them do that. Um, if, you're, if you're not comfortable with it, then you want to spray fix it yourself so you don't put that, that burden on somebody else. But um, now there's some, there's some bounce light happening in the shadow area. So just by allowing this to remain the tone of the paper, it creates that, that contrast in the, the shadow area. So now I have some bounce light that I can indicate. So it just can be very delicate in these areas um, to help reveal some of that. Um, and and what, what can be helpful along this stretch here is to be mindful of the fact that this is this becomes really a flat plane across here, and so all of those marks get really squished and kind of horizontal. Not the most specific of terms I've used in this course or in this video, I mean. So squished and horizontal is the best way I can describe it. <laughs> Um, I know we, we all probably come up with kind of unique ways of describing things. Um, but right, right in here, this light here is particularly helpful in revealing the structure of this back wing, um, where it's a little bit flatter and it's catching some of the bounce light. And then we have this other wing that comes in and obscures it. Um, if we need to sharpen that up, I can drop a line in there.
actually, I think I overexposed to this. That's probably a better, better view of this. Um, now let's see, back to this. I want to just kind of soften this transition a little bit more in this area and then get back to that tail section. All right, so back in here, um, I want to rest my hand. So I'm kind of I provided a hard line for that lower section and I'm a softer edge in that top to help create that rounded quality of this little feathery spike that the duck has. And then right in here, what I, what you try to pay attention to the, the brightest brights. Where is it the strongest? So generally it's at that, that point of contact between the changing planes. So right in here, kind of right in here. Um, and it falls kind of into shadow a little bit more. And then this is kind of an interesting structure. So I'll just to use a light, light pressure here to maintain that value and shadow structure, but we kind of fall into shadow on this side, but it really catches the light, or is it strongest, right in here. So again, thinking about the cross contour and the flow, the direction of the feathers. So now we're gonna, getting in the territory we were talking about earlier. Uh, with Stephanie's comment about the the focal point being the kind of the head, so now I've added I've created a little bit more refinement here, which should pull our attention. We have a stronger value contrast here, however, um, and those could compete with one another. So now I have a decision to make about that. So actually, I'm going to use the blending stump. Uh, for, but before I make that decision, I think I'm just going to finish off this section here. Um, uh, you know, we talked about um, turning edges a lot lately. So I think it's a good good time to evaluate your edges. So you look along at, at the edges. Do they feel like they turn into the... Um, you know, around the form. Uh, and if not, the, the thing to check is the variety along that edge. Um, you know, check to see if the direction of the marks really wrap around that form, um, if there is a sufficient variety in terms of how sharp or dull the edges are, or diffuse the edges are. Um, Is there a change in contrast along that edge? So along in here, just following the direction of the feathers, just kind of with this rocking motion to suggest the, uh, the texture there. I go right over the edge of that. Um, the wing there, and then use the eraser to sharpen that up. And because it's erasing down to the gray, it's actually creating a darker mark there. Um, I want harder charcoal right on this section. And 
I think I want to create a little bit more contrast. So along this edge, for example, if it feels too flat, just look at that value contrast from side to side and try to create more variety. So right in here, it gets a little bit darker. Um, and, and you can change it, you can create that variety sometimes just by changing the direction of the marks. Um, some, it's not you know, it doesn't have to be a value shift, it can just be a, a shift in texture, direction. I didn't quite get this negative space right, but I, I'm not gonna fuss with it. So something I, because that negative space is in, incongruent with what I'm seeing in the reference photo, something is definitely off, but I don't think it's off sufficiently to, to really be a concern. All right, so just kind of using the length of the pencil, dragging, so it's kind of a light land on the page and then dragging and lifting to kind of suggest some of the texture in here. And just be careful not to create you know, stripes, right? So vary your marks, make them feel naturally formed. Keep rotating the pencil. Um, we see a change in direction here. So there's almost like this swirling motion in the feathers as you get up close to it. And again, you're, you're kind of in control of the, the threshold for, for refinement and detail. So if, if that's a level of detail that you're just not concerned with, that's totally fine. But if you wanna, you wanna suggest more detail, then I think that really focusing on the direction of the feathers is really a key thing. Um, and I think in order, right now this just feels unfinished, not like a shadow, so if I can get a little bit more texture in here to make it feel more finished, I think it'll be helpful. And then what I might do is just bring more light on this side. Um, oh, I just kind of caught this. I think I need a little bit more texture in here. Sorry, just kind of focusing a little bit more, so less less talking than I would normally do. It's easier to talk in the early stages of this drawing. A little bit harder when uh, we're about ready to finish this up. Um, now, I didn't go back and finish the um, the water area, but I don't know. I do need to get going. Um, and I'm not sure adding much to the water is gonna be helpful. But if you want to get back in there, um, it can be helpful to um, kind of refine some of the, the shadow areas. You know, so right in here. You just be careful, again, about that edge variation. You know, my focus on this has been primarily on, again, that turning edge to create a sense of form and volume. So um, what I'd be looking for in creating more clarity in the water is to, for it to support the structure of the duck, not just for the sake of doing it. Um, I think I might actually add a little bit of white in here to suggest some of the reflection. And actually, I think I wanna see what happens if I do this. Bring in some of the white in here to, to really kind of I don't know, enhance the reflection into here. Um, but I hopefully, hopefully this was enough to really get you started. Again, if, you, um, if you've had trouble posting on Artist Network lately, the problem should be resolved now. It was working this morning, but it was a web issue that we were, it took us a few days to resolve, and I don't know exactly what it was. Unfortunately, I don't have that level of knowledge on how websites function on the back end, but um, we should be able to share your work now. There's a link in the description um, on, for the show page where you can share your work when you're done. If you're new, I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us for this. Next week, we're going to be back with our Art of the Steel episode where we're, we are a series where we 
um, create master copies of um, you know, famous artists' works. So we're looking at Van Gogh next week, doing a master copy of a Van Gogh drawing, using that as a way to really analyze its mark making and see what we can learn about who he was as an artist through the deconstruction of the process um, and insights we gain from trying to better understand what's behind the marks. So um, again, I want to thank you all for, for joining me. Um, this has been great. I'm sorry if I missed any questions. Oh, Greg says, do you have issues with the white not coming through over the dark? There, there is a, a difference sometimes in the brands of the, the white charcoal. Um, I really do like this. This is the Primo white charcoal, but um, Generals also makes like a pastel chalk. That is a good one here. Um, so sometimes that can be the case. And if it's, um, uh, if you're working on toned paper, sometimes you need to kind of erase up the layer of charcoal underneath. If there's some dark charcoal underneath, that could, that'll really kill the white. It won't get super bright. So, um, yeah, so give, give those things a look and see what, um, what might help, you know, increase the, the intensity of the white there. Um, but this has been a blast. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for putting up with my, my, my thumbnail there of Monty Python choosing a duck. That's the first thing I thought of was Monty Python and the Holy Grail. So just having some fun. Um, everybody have a fantastic week. Um, I might work on this for a little bit more, and then I'll post that on artistnetwork.com. So check out that show page. should be in a day or two. I'll post that up there. Um, I'm sorry if I missed any questions. Join me again um, th every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern. That's what we do, drawing together. See you next week for the, for the Van Gogh.